hear about his wonders, his glory, his goodness, his sweetness. I'll try my best to fulfill your desires and maybe even fulfill a few dreams. Not here, but when you go to sleep tonight. So uh, just one little rule. Uh, if there are children, little children, and they start to shout out or scream or start running around, uh, I would appreciate on the part of the parents to please take them outside, bring them over near the restaurant so that all those who have come for the purpose of listening to these uh, ideas for their spiritual benefit will be able to obtain that and not be interrupted or discouraged or disappointed. Okay. Again, thank you for coming. Everything I say tonight is based upon the works, the books, the ideas of my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, here. Without his mercy, without his grace, I wouldn't be able to say anything tonight. For it is by his mercy that I was introduced to Krishna, through his glorious book, the Krishna book, which you can find outside on the table, which goes into the whole philosophy of Krishna consciousness. And for those of you who like to read novels, I've written my own little version, which is called The Supreme Mystic, and it absorbs you into the pastimes and ideally provokes enough interest so that you will read more about the philosophy, understand it, and then incorporate it or apply it to your own life. Okay? So we'll begin with uh, Jayarada Madhava. That will be followed by a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, again, I thank you for uh, bearing the heat. Uh, there's an old saying that austerity is the wealth of the Brahmins. So I would have to say just about everybody here is a Brahmin tonight <laughs> because it's not easy to listen to a discourse which has some s complexity and also simplicity during a very hot day. But uh, we should be glad, though, because if you go to India, this may be 95, but there it can be 115 to 120. So we're doing quite good. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Jana Vallabha Kiri Vardhari Jaya Gopi Jana Vallabha Kiri Vardhari Gopi Jana Yasura Nandan of the Janda Rang Jano Yasura Nandan of the Janda Rang Jano Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Kunjabi Hari Jaya Kopi Jana Vala Bhagirivara Dari Kopi Jana 
Jag gick upp i Genneval och bag i vardagen. Gick upp i Genneval. Jag såg den landande över till Genneval. Jag såg den landande över till Genneval. Genneval. Yamuna tira vana chari Yamuna tira vana chari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Hari Ramu, Hari Ramu, Ramu Ramu, Hari Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna. Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada. Jaya Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Paribhaja Kacharya Astatura Sata Shri Shri Mat His Divine Grace A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jaya is gone founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. And all glories to Sri Sri Guru and Gauranga. <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So I will be reading from the Bhagavad Gita. Some of you have copies. And uh, if any of us here would like to get copies, we have them outside on the table. Some of you have received a copy, a complimentary copy. If you want to refer to it, please do so. Before I begin the actual talk, uh, let me just mention that the topic of today's, uh, or the subject of today's talk, is generating yogic ecstasy within yourself. Everybody likes to be ecstatic. Everyone likes to be blissful. Everyone likes to be happy. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, why we often don't have it and how we can easily obtain it. Okay? So, starting from the <coughs> Bhagavad Gita verse, I'm sorry. Yonta su konataramas tatanta jyotir evya sa yogi brahma nirvanam brahma bhuto digachati. Translation. <coughs> One whose happiness is within, who is active and rejoices within, and whose aim is inward, is actually the perfect mystic. He is liberated in the Supreme, and ultimately he attains the Supreme. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Unless, purport means comment, uh, the meaning behind this. Unless one is able to relish happiness from within. Now what, am I mean? what does he mean by within? Within what? Within the heart, here. That's the within that's being talked about. God dwells within the heart. So what is being stated here is one whose happiness is within by contacting, by unifying with, by connecting with the Supreme Lord in consciousness. When one has that, he gains true, real happiness. So that's the within that is being talked. It's not within a room or within a bus or within a car. It's within your heart. Okay, so we all clear on that? And anybody who comes in late, if they ask, what does he mean with this within? Everybody will be able to tell him or her, okay? The heart. 
That's where the soul is, and that's where the super soul is. Super soul, another name for super soul is <clears throat> Paramatma or Shamasundra. Okay? That's where he dwells for the devotees. Purport, unless one is able to relish happiness from within, how can one retire from the external engagements meant for deriving superficial happiness? I'll read that again since I had a little competition there. Unless one is able to relish happiness from within, one of my saboteurs, unless one can, is able to relish happiness from within, how can one retire from the external engagements meant for deriving superficial happiness? So two kinds of happiness are being described. Superficial happiness, surface, and deep, profound happiness. Skin, superficial. Inside the skin, profound. Okay? Superficial happiness, I'll be describing that in a few moments. A liberated, excuse me, I'll turn the page. A liberated person enjoys happiness by factual experience. Now, what do we mean by a liberated person? Are we talking about a person who's been living under a, uh, uh, a, a dictatorship? Socialistic government, liberated from what? So most people, when they hear liberation, they think of pol pol politics. We don't mean politics there. All of us are under the sway or the influence or the pressure of material energy. We become hungry, that's the force of material energy. We become sleepy, that's the force of material energy. We become attractive to dirt certain people, that's the force of material energy. We become hateful towards certain people. That's the force of material energy. Some of us like to run and play and jump. Some of us like to lazy and sleep and just become inert. That's the force of material energy. Different kinds of forces working. Forces in the mode of goodness, which has brought all of you here because this is all about that which is good and useful and beneficial for your life. Then there's the mode of passion, which as I just mentioned, people like to run, people like to jump, people like to compete, people like to challenge. Mode of passion. We all have a little bit of, little bit of that in us. Especially if you're good at something, some particular skill or talent, you like to generally display it or exhib exhibit it and show it off so that you get a little prestige, a little applause, a little honor. And then there's the mode of ignorance. Mode of ignorance is that mode which we all fall into at about nine, between nine and 11 o'clock at night. It's called sleepiness. And when we feel sleepy, often during the day, we can understand that that part of energy, material energy, is working on us, which is the mode of ignorance. And you feel inert, you feel tired, you feel listless, you feel uh, like you don't want to do anything, you don't even want to go to work, You'd rather rob a bank if you can get away with it. So you want to do something that is, does not get something quick without having to work hard for it because work is just drudge. That's the feeling of a person who's in the mode of ignorance. Okay? So now we all have an understanding of what material energy is, right? Material energy? Okay. Mode of goodness is what? Raise your hand if you know. Now just raise your hand. And I'll call you. Mode of goodness. Okay, got it. Mode of passion. I gave a few examples. Come on. Anybody listening? No, you, I called you. Go ahead. Yes, competing. Excellent. Mode of, mode of ignorance. Everybody knows that one. <laughs> no? Nobody knows it? Yes, go ahead. Yes, laziness and sleepiness, inertia, indifference, apathy, uncaringness. When somebody says, oh, I got a pain in my back, and you'd say, so what? Who cares? I got pain in my shoulder. This is mode of ignorance, okay? Mode of goodness is how can I relieve you? How can I help you? Can I give you a, a massage? Can I put a cold press on your shoulder? Uh, you want to relieve. You want to do something useful, something good, something beneficial, helpful. That's mode of goodness. And most of us here probably are in a good part of mode of goodness. So let me continue. <clears throat> I just want to define these terms, especially for persons who are new here. And if I go on talking and I use these terms and you don't 
know what I mean by these terms, then it's just a batch of words signifying nothing because the definitions have not been given. Such a liberated, so you all know what liberation means. To be liberated means to be free from the force, the pressure, the urges uh, of the material energy. So a person may be hungry, but a person who is highly in the mode of goodness or pure goodness, he can put off his hu hunger. He can, he can do without it, eating for a few hours if necessary. Or something else. Or a person has to study for something. He can put his mind to it. Uh, so liberation means when these forces don't disturb you, upset you, shake you, uh, uh, harm you. Uh, for example, if you're in the mode of ignorance and you have to be at a job at 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning, but it just feels so good to be lying in that bed. You, who wants to get up? You know? so, but, and, and if you don't get up, you can, if you do that a few times, you might lose your job. And jobs are scarce nowadays. So if you lose the job, then that's the result of the mode of ignorance. So here in Krishna consciousness, we cultivate the mode of goodness as a means to a mode of even higher goodness, which is called pure goodness. And pure goodness is, uh, I will explain as we go along, but I've already explained what goodness is, and you're all familiar with that. People who are in the medical profession trying to do good for people, uh, people who are in the dental profession, uh, lawyer profession, uh, teaching professions, uh, any type of a profession which does benefit or help or good to some other human being, welfare work, uh, is considered mode of goodness. But there is even a mode higher than that, which I will be glad to uh, describe shortly. Uh, this, so uh, the important point is such a liberated person no longer desires external material happiness. This state is called Brahma Bhuta. I'll say it again. Brahma Bhuta means self realized state. And that comes from the Srimad Bhagavatam scripture from the fourth canto, the 30th chapter, and the 20th verse. This Brahma Bhuta, attaining which one is assured of going back to Godhead, back to home. So, where, where is this back to Godhead? Where's back to home? Most people think when I say home, it means wherever you live. You know, some of you live in Fullerton. That's not the home I'm referring to. Or if you live in West Los Angeles, that's not the home that's being referred to here. The home that's being referred to here is the home we originally were in many, many millions of years ago. And that is called the home of Godhead, the home where the Supreme Lord dwells, the home where we all dwelled at one point in time, or in, I should say, timelessness. Uh, that is the uh, world of pure goodness. What do they do in that world? That world is a world in which people glorify God, honor God, applaud God, sing songs to God, cook for God. Their whole life, their every moment is committed to and consecrated to the, the, the service to the Lord, the pleasure of the Lord. That's all they are interested in is giving pleasure to God. Why? Well, when you give pleasure to the Lord and the Lord is particularly happy he reciprocates and returns that pleasure that you gave him back to your own heart. And you then feel great joy, great happiness, great satisfaction. So that's in the spiritual world where we all originally were. But at one point in timelessness, we all began to wonder, what does it feel like to be a Lord, to be worshipped, to be honored, to be glorified, to be applauded, what does it feel like to be in the helm position? Because in the spiritual world, everyone is a servant. There may be higher servants and lower servants, but everyone serves God. Because we are all, we were all manifested from the Lord. We're all dependent upon God. For example, even today, if the Lord stopped the air from moving and you couldn't breathe, then that would be the end of it. But the, God is enabling us to breathe. He gives us lungs, gives us nose, and we can take the air in. He gives us the sunshine by which food can be uh, developed. He gives us, as I said, wind to blow. He has the earth by which <clears throat> trees can grow, vegetables can grow, fruits can grow. Uh, he gives us the resources to make homes, 
so that you can have an apartment house, you can have a, your own home, you can have a mansion. All these things are available as a result of the Lord of God creating earth, water, fire, air, ether, and then on the subtle level, mind, intelligence, and false ego. So that's what is called the separated material energy of God. Now the unseparated material, the unseparated energy of God is you and you and you and I. We are what is known as living entities or spiritual souls. Uh, besides this material energy, there is a spiritual energy which is uh, found throughout uh, the universe and is uh, exploiting the resources of material inferior nature. The inferior nature is the material energy. As I said, rock, sand, air, all of these things, material energy used by us and used by God to help in the creation and the maintenance of this world. Okay? <clears throat> So, coming to the, uh, so at some, a certain point, while we were in the spiritual world, we decided that we no longer wanted to live there because we wanted to experience what it was like to be a Lord. What does it feel like to be worshipped? What does it feel like to be honored? What does it feel like to be applauded always? What does it feel like to be bowed down to? If we're servants, we're not getting that. We're doing that. But when you're the Lord, you're getting that. So the curiosity is there in all living beings. When that curiosity becomes so in intense, so strong, that we no longer want to serve God, but rather we want to serve our desire for pleasure, our desire for proprietorship, our desire for controllership. You know, people use this term, you're a control freak. You all heard that term? Controller. The, the people trying to dominate, people trying to gain possession, people trying to push people out of positions. So controllership is there. And also friendship. Everyone is a friend to the Lord in the spiritual world. So here we come, we need, we also want to feel what it's like to have so many people like us, so many people uh, uh, be our friend. So this world was created for that purpose. This is known as the material world, as opposed to, as distinguished from, the spiritual world. Okay? In the spiritual world, everyone serves, surrender, surrenders, and sacrifices himself or herself for the pleasure of God. In this world, what we try to do is we try to feel what it's like to be an enjoyer. What does it mean to be an enjoyer? Lots of pleasure for the tongue, pleasure for the ears, pleasure for the eyes, pleasure for the nose, pleasure for the skin, pleasure for the genitals. Pleasure, 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 all of which is what? It's temporary. It's here today, gone tomorrow, here for a few minutes, gone the next few minutes. That's one kind of pleasure, the pleasure of the senses. Then there's the pleasure of the mind. The pleasure of the mind is that uh, we achieve different skills, different abilities, which we use to make our living. <coughs> so people appreciate us, they honor us, they may glorify us, they thank us for the skills that we cultivate, and we contribute and provide from our skills comforts and conveniences and means for other people, okay? So then there's, there's the, as I said, then there's the intelligence. The intelligence is what we use to figure things out. For, for example, you get a puzzle, you get a problem, and you can't figure it out immediately. So you ponder it, you absorb yourself into it, and then little by little the things sort of come together. Sometimes they come together immediately, and sometimes they come together later, and sometimes you're sleeping and suddenly, anybody have this experience? You suddenly wake up like a flash and you got the answer to it? I know I've had that pro uh, question. I think I couldn't figure it out, but I got to figure it out somehow in my sleep. So that's the intelligence. And then there's the ego, false ego. Now false ego is the principle of thinking that we are our bodies. 
And this is a devastating principle. Okay, thank you. This is a devastating principle. When I think I am my physical body, then whatever I acquire with this body, I consider to be mine. My acquisition, my acquirement. So I consider it to be an extension of my own body. Now, for example, if somebody gives you a slap or a push on your body, generally speaking, you, you get a little upset. You say, hey, what are you doing? Well, what, what's, what's in your mind? What, what, why are you doing that? You get upset because we value our body. We cherish the body. This is me. But if you knew for real, for true, that this was not really you, you would have a different response, which I will give in a moment. So we have an extended body. The extended body is, for example, you buy a car. Well, you earn your money with your body. And then with your body, you buy the car. Then you consider that the car is first yours, but then you consider it you because if somebody starts sitting on the fender or starting somebody bangs into it, then you get upset, you may get disturbed, you may get shaken up. What are you doing? Why have you done that? Where, where did you get your license? Did you buy your license downtown someplace? So a uh, person may start thinking, but he's upset because he feels that he or she has been in some way disturbed. But has he or she been disturbed? Absolutely not. So the, you have a little fender bender. It doesn't hurt you. Or you may be, for example, your family name. Somebody makes fun of your name. People get upset over this because they're identifying the name with the body. So somebody says, hey, stupid Smith, or hey, uh, D dumb Jones, or anything like that. Then you may say, who are you, who are you calling dumb? What, what, what's, what, where do you get that? So, the point is this, a person becomes upset when anything he or she owns, anything he or she is identified with, uh, what happens is the result uh, is, is that they uh, become upset, they become disturbed, they become shaken, and the result is that they can, uh, is that their, their life becomes very, by the way, the class doesn't end now, it ends at six. Oh, okay. I thought that uh, somebody thought it was ends at six. It doesn't end at six. It ends, excuse me, it ends at six, and we have another 15 minutes yet. Sorry, you're going to miss a very funny story. <laughs> it's coming up. <clears throat> I always save the good stuff for the end. So uh, anyway, what happens is that, um, uh, is that we become disturbed, we become ruffled, we become shaken, and we become despondent, or we become depressed. Well, we become uh, very, very unsettled. And this is unfortunate, and it's not necessary. It all comes from a false identification with the body. And the purpose of Krishna consciousness is to teach us how to disidentify ourselves with our body. So it's one thing to think, well, yes, I'm not my body, but it's quite another thing to actually practice. Now, a person who does not identify himself or herself with the physical body will not be upset if somebody calls him a fool, somebody calls him a jerk or an idiot. In fact, if somebody calls him that, he will say, how did you know? How did you find out? He's not upset, not disturbed, because he thinks of himself in a very humble way, very humble manner, that he is a fool, he is a jerk. And next to God, who isn't? And that's his identity. He feels his smallness, he feels his insignificance, feels his unimportance, his inconsiderableness next to the Lord. So therefore, he doesn't identify himself with his physical body. His body is nothing. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. It's a, it's a, a pr product of God's handiwork. And it's not to be identified with at all. Shall we all start dancing? <laughs> I like the music. Sounds like a rumba. <laughs> so anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, what? Uh, yeah, if you could turn your cell phone off, that would be appreciated. Because otherwise, uh, uh, next thing you know, we'll be hearing you 
uh, conversation. <laughs> We'd like to keep it private. Thank you. So uh, getting on to the point of uh, not identifying yourself you know, with your physical body uh, is that nothing bothers you, nothing disturbs you. If your car gets dented, it doesn't bother you because you're not thinking, I am the car. If your house uh, comes down, you don't get upset or disturbed. You just deal with it. That's all. It's not me. I'm not the house. I'm not the apartment. I'm not the car. I'm not the chair. I'm not any of these things. I am what? What are we? We are the spirit soul within. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, for the soul there is neither birth nor death at any time. It has not come into being. It does not come into being. It will not come into being. It is unborn, eternal, ever existing and primeval. And it is not slain when the body is slain. So we are the soul. The purpose of Krishna consciousness is to help us to realize that we are the soul and to experience the joy, the pleasure, the peace, the uplift, the satisfaction and fulfillment of this consciousness of ourselves as pure soul and not contaminated soul, which we all are. What do I mean by contaminated soul? It means we have lust, greed, anger, envy, illusion, <clears throat> pride, arrogance, gluttony, all of these are covering the soul and not allowing the soul to experience itself in its original true identity. So what it's experiencing is the pains, the sufferings, the difficulties, the tribulations, the problems of these different feelings that I just described of anger and lust and greed and so forth. That's all it brings. But once we get rid of those lower feelings and replace them with higher feelings, faith, hope, love, courage, strength, compassion, humility, <clears throat> patience, tolerance, understanding. I'm giving you a list of different good qualities that when we have these qualities, we then become able to experience ourselves as souls. Otherwise, what we experience ourselves is an illusion of who we are. Yes, I'm this angry person. Yes, I'm this impatient person. Yes, I'm this pleasure-seeking person. I'm this joyful person. I'm this hungry person. I'm this sleepy. I'm none of those. As it is said in the Bhagavad Gita, that which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible. No one can slay this imperishable soul. The soul cannot be killed by any weapons. It cannot be burned by fire. It cannot be moistened by water. It cannot be dried by the wind. It's eternal. It's ever-existing. It's primeval. You, I, everyone here are forever. But if we identify ourselves with the body, and we know the body is not forever, anything that threatens the body, shakes the body, disturbs the body, we become frightened because the body can die, and none of us want to die. Why? Because, as I said, really and truly, we have the intuition that we all are supposed to be here eternally, because we are eternal. But we've identified ourselves with the uneternal, the non-eternal, the body, and consequently, we react when the body is in any way threatened. Okay? So, the whole point of chanting Hare Krishna which are the names of God, are to remove those impurities that I just mentioned so that the soul will be completely clean and pure and spotless. And when the soul is pure, it's clean and spotless, it can then perceive the more subtle vibrations of spirituality. <coughs> One can then begin to communicate with the super soul who is within the heart, right beside it. And now what is the value of being able to, con to uh, communicate with the su The super soul is God. God knows everything. So isn't it a wonderful thing to be able to get guidance from God, advice from God, 
direction from God, to be inspired by the Lord. What a wonderful life. You can't go wrong because God is omniscient. He knows everything. He's everywhere present. He's all-powerful and all-loving. So if we're able to communicate with, we're able to contact, we're able to uh, make touch with the Supreme Lord, our lives become truly successful because God guides us. He directs us. He moves us. He gives us direction. He gives us guidance, what we should do, what we should not do. The Bhagavad Gita, does the, the, those are the words of God. So being the words of God from the Bhagavad Gita, this confirms what he also will uh, help us to know from within. So as I said in today's talk, how we can, uh, as it mentioned, uh, generating excuse me, yogic ecstasy. So how does this yogic ecstasy work? Well, first of all, ecstasy, yogic ecstasy comes from contact with the Supreme Lord. And I've just given an exposition uh, or uh, an, an ex explanation of how we become to contact Krishna. We purify. The soul becomes pure and purer and purer and purer. And then we can actually see God within ourselves. We can see God everywhere in the world. We can see God in every body, wherever we look. So we don't see just the body when we're looking at someone. We see the, Lord, we see the person and we also see the Lord within, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, the humble sage, by virtue of true knowledge, sees with equal vision a learned and gentle Brahmin, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog eater. So when he sees a dog, he sees the dog, but he sees God. When he sees a cow, he sees the cow and also God. He sees a human being, he sees also the Lord. So such a consciousness is called God consciousness. When we have God consciousness, how can we but not love everyone once we learn to love God? If I'm looking at you, or looking at you, and looking at you, and I'm seeing God there, and I love God, then how can I not love you since God is within you? I may not love some of the qualities that you may have, but those are temporary. One day they will be gone, but the Lord will stay with you. So therefore, I cannot help but love you, the soul, and love the supreme soul. So that's how we generate real love amongst each other. We need to first develop love of God. Once you love God, you will love everyone. You can't help it. You will see God in everyone, everything. A true, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, a true yogi sees, a true yogi sees me in all beings and sees all beings in me, indeed. The self-realized soul sees me, the same Supreme Lord, everywhere. For one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, I am never lost, nor is he ever lost to me. So Krishna is saying that you're dear to him. He loves you. He says the pure devotee is always within the core of my heart, and I am always within the heart of the pure devotee. The devotee does not know anything else but me. And I do not know anything else but him or her. Therefore, entanglement between the soul and the super soul is the desirable or the desideratum. This is what we want, to be entangled with God and disentangled from the material energy of God. Because once we become disentangled from that, our life is peaceful, our life is joyful. When we begin to connect with Krishna, we feel the vibration of Krishna's love flowing in our heart. When we feel that, we feel ecstatic. And that ecstasy just literally bubbles over. You can't help but smiling. You look at the sunshine, you love it because it's from God. You look at the trees, you love it because it's from God. You look at this beautiful flower. You love it because it's from God. Well, I won't cheat you. You can have one too. It's part of my left hand. So you love it because it's from the Lord. And you smell it. It's fragrant. God is fragrant. He's sweet. He gave it to him. He, he, he experienced it. This is what love of God is. You 
receive it, you relish it, you cherish it, and you share it. It's not just, that's what selfishness is. It's for me and me alone. The more I have, the more I want. The more I want, the more I will get. This is selfishness. But God consciousness is, the more I get, the more I will give away. And the more I give away, because God is gracious. God is not a, is not a pauper. He's not a miser. And the more I give away, the more he will pile on top of me. So my problem becomes, who am I going to give this to? I got so much. Some people I know, they have a lot of money. One person I was talking to. He says, yeah, he says, the more I give away, I keep getting more. He has b b bonds in the bond market. He says, I, I keep getting more, so I have to keep giving it away. And he says, it's a problem being wealthy. He says, when I, ha he says, when I had nothing, it was simple. I didn't have to think about who to give it away. I didn't have anything to give away. <laughs> so that was the uh, situation then. Anyway, uh, the important point that I wanted to make is that if we want real ecstasy, not just the pleasures of the five senses, the intelligence and the mind, which are temporary, which are here today, gone tomorrow, which will disappear and will leave us in a state of anxiety because once you've tasted a pleasure, now the pleasure is gone, where do you get your next fix? We want pleasure. That's why we're here. That's how we become a Lord. The more pleasure you have, the more you want. God gets pleasure unlimitedly. We want to imitate him. We want to be like him. But in the material world, pleasure is limited. You get only so much. And now you eat a meal. You enjoy it. It's over. Okay, where do I get my next pleasure? You want more pleasure. Maybe my ear. Let me go and listen to some music. Listen to music for two, three hours. Okay, my ears are tired. Where do I get my next pleasure? It's endless. But when you have God consciousness, it's different. It's like an underground flowing spring. It's always there. You always feel it. Sometimes the waves are just two feet high. Sometimes the waves are four feet. Sometimes when you're worshiping the deity or you're hearing the kirtan, they go 10, 15, 20 feet high. You want to jump and touch the ceiling. It's so ecstatic because you're in touch with God. He's giving you his mercy. He's drowning you. He's drenching you. He's saturating your soul and making you feel what it's like to be really, truly, deeply, profoundly happy. Isn't that something to desire rather than just our ordinary, daily, uh, little pleasures which come and go? And then finally, even if you achieve some big position in some big company, yeah, you, at the time of death, you have to leave it. And somebody else replaces you. And in five years, five days, who knows? You're forgotten. Better to work for something real and true that's forever. And go back home, back to Godhead, to the eternal world. And spend your life serving and loving and adoring and applauding and glorifying God. He wants us all. He wants to have us. He loves us all. That's why he's having me say this tonight. And everyone, when you chant your rounds <clears throat> tomorrow or tonight... Chant it with your whole heart. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Come on, I want to hear it. Hare Ram. Yeah. Ram, Ram, Ram. Yeah, you put your whole heart into it. Like you're desperate. Suppose you were just going to die in five minutes. And you could, and you're destined to go to hell. But in this five minutes, you could save yourself by just chanting this holy name in such a way as to convince the Lord that you're sorry for all your offenses and sins and wrongs. So you wouldn't just go, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram. You're going to go to hell anyway. No question about it. But if you can convince the Supreme Lord, Hare Krishna, come on, let's do it. Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hari, 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 Ram. Oh, you get the jets, get the jets. We'll fly everybody there right now. <laughs> yes, that's the, way you, that's the way spiritual life must be carried out from the heart, not from the head. Head is mechanical. Head is robotic. Head, head is just, you do it because you learned it, but you don't really feel it. So many devotees, they chant that way. They don't chant with the whole heart. Let's look at a picture of Krishna 
and see him and, and address the mantra. What does the mantra mean? My dear Lord, please engage me in your transcendental loving service. Engage me in your service so that I can please you, so that I can give myself to you, so that I can sacrifice, get rid of all my impurities, and thereby please you. So it just so happens to be that uh, sometimes <clears throat> persons uh, don't uh, have difficulty making decisions because they're not in touch with Krishna. You know, we, we call that the dilemma. Should I do this? Or should I do that? Should I do this? And sometimes we try to please some of the people whom we know <clears throat> who say we should do certain things. For example, there was a man, and he was, uh, very, he was going very poor. So he decided, in order to make his mortgage payments, that he would sell his donkey. He had a donkey, an ass. And um, figured he would take it to the market, and he would get whatever price he could, so that at least he could make his mortgage payments. So... <clears throat> What happened was that he had a son about 10 years old. And uh, so what happened is he got on the donkey and the son took the, took the reins and was leading the, uh, the donkey along the road. And then they passed this group of women. And, and, and the women said, how could you do this? Look at your son. He's only 10 years old. And you're riding on the ass and the son is walking that's not fair. You should, he, he should be riding. He's your son. He will develop hostility towards you. He will hate the world as a result. So he said, okay, okay, okay. So he got off the horse. He took the son, helped him up on the horse. And the ladies, they all nodded. They had yes. Otherwise, that was child, child, child abuse. Now you're doing the right thing. So he went on a little bit further. Uh, and and um, the, the son was riding on the horse. And the man was just uh, leading the horse. And then they came to a group of men, and the men started shaking their head. They said, how can you let your son ride on that horse? He, you're spoiling him. When the time he gets older, he will expect everyone to applaud him, to bow down to him, to think he's great. Look at him, sitting there like a proud king. Get him off the horse, or either you both get on the horse, but he shouldn't be on the horse by himself. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so the man got up on the ass, and he Gotten, uh, had the son in front, and then they drove a little bit further, and the, 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 the donkey was getting tired. It was slogging, you know, just dragging. So they passed a group of people, and the people said, how could you do this? Look at you. That donkey looks like it's going to die. If you're bringing it for the market, it'll be dead before it gets to the market. This is, this is abusive. This is uh, animal cruelty. You should not do this. Give the donkey, give that ass a chance. Okay, okay. I'll do so he, him and his son, they got off, and they said, give me a pole. So they got a pole. They tied the four legs and the back legs of the donkey together, and then they put the pole through the legs, and then they put the pole on one shoulder, and then the son put it on his shoulder. So the ass was hanging up, it was upside down, okay? And they were walking. So, so as they entered the town, people saw this. They said, what's going on here? This is, this is, something's wrong. You ride the ass. You don't carry it. This is, this is crazy. What, what's wrong with this? This is madness. So they started laughing and laughing. And the laughter grew louder and louder and louder and louder. Finally, they were coming to a small little wooden bridge, you know, with the railing there. So the laughter was so loud that the poor ass got scared. And he started squirming around. Finally, he threw himself up and over the railing down into the river. And the man looked down. It's gone. He said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I tried to please everybody. And I ended up pleasing nobody. And worst of all, I lost my ass in the bargain. That was the whole thing. So what happens is that Sometimes we, we succumb to different pressure groups. And we don't have a, our conscience is not developed. We develop our conscience by performing spiritual practices. And this way, if somebody tries to influence you to do this or to that, what happens is that you know what you must do because you want to do 
the will of God. Like we had this very interesting political situation, I think it was in Kentucky. A woman did not want to issue marriage licenses to a same-sex couple. So she says, well, then that's the Bible. I follow that law. So the Supreme Court says, well, you're supposed to follow this law. So she was doing what di her conscience dictated. Even if she had to lose her job, she wasn't concerned because that's what her life was based on, her convictions. And she'd rather die for her convictions than succumb to an act which would be opposed or adverse to the will of God. So just to conclude uh, the talk for tonight, um, our main business is to try to be more heart-feeling. When you chant, chant with the heart. When you hear the Bhagavatam class, hear with your heart, not just something going on. Uh, when you serve, serve with the heart. How do you serve with the heart? This is the way I do it, and I'm not always successful. But when I'm doing something, for example, I'm preparing for food. So I say, this is for you, Krishna. And then I put something water in, this is for you, Krishna. So I try to keep Krishna in the forefront of my mind. And let me say this, that the more I do that, the more joyful the activity becomes. Because it becomes a truly, genuinely spiritual act. An act that is pleasing to Krishna, and he expresses his pleasure, reciprocating it in my heart, and making and preparing the food for Krishna becomes a wonderful experience. I'm just giving you an example. We try to, so that's how you involve the heart. This is for you, Krishna. Not, this is just food. I'm preparing it for you. Why for you? Because I'm trying to develop. Not I love you. I'm trying to develop love for you. Right now, my love is very shallow. But by your grace, I can develop more and more and more because you are the source of all love. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Also, any of you who would like to buy a copy of my book, you can get it outside or from me. It's all about Krishna, the supreme mystic. Okay? Hare Krishna. Nice to see you again. How you been?